Hello, and welcome to Opening the Curtain, an interview series of Artists in Conversation with Students. My name is Victor Deng, and I'm a freshman at Gunn High School. Today, I'm interviewing William Thomas Hodgson, who is a theater maker, educator, and activist. Hi, William. Hey. As an introduction to those watching this interview at home, could you please explain what it is you do for a living and any specifics your job might entail? So um, currently, I'm the co-artistic director of Oakland Theatre Project. I produce six shows a year about that. Uh, sometimes I'm performing in the shows. I'm also an actor, uh, so I'm working on stage, and then I'm just trying to upkeep my career, right? Auditioning for everything I can, uh, uh, making sure my materials are current, things like that. And then beyond that, there's a, a list of other jobs that I, I juggle at any one moment just to kind of make end, ends meet and also keep myself engaged. I teach, um, I organize around a lot of things, kind of like producing as a freelancer. Um, yeah, so it's not a succinct job title, but there's a lot I've been doing lately. Wow, okay. In a sense, your plate seems very full. And that's the way I like it too. I, I wouldn't complain about it. You know, when, when it's not full, that's probably when I'm complaining either because I'm really, really poor or I'm bored. <laughs> Thinking about how you got to where you are currently in your career, do you happen to have a favorite story or lesson you'd like to share? I think one of my favorite lessons that I've learned is how to be selfish. Like it, in, in theater arts, we, we learn how to give attention to one another. That is, that is what theater is, us giving attention to one another in a space, audience and actors, actors and other actors. Um, but it, it was a big life lesson and a big kind of evolution in my artistic career to recognize when I need to be selfish or when I need to draw attention to the needs of the production or the needs of my character or the needs of me as an actor in the space. Um, kind of the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? But, but then you have the, the remorse of getting the grease. And so, so balancing back, that back and forth is really necessary for theater. I don't know if I have like a favorite story. I think one of my more recent ones. So I opened a show uh, and did one performance and then we had to close because of uh, COVID quarantine restrictions. And in that show, there was a big surprise. We wrote a song. We kind of interviewed the audience at the beginning of the show and then wrote a song about them and performed it live at the end of the show. And to see their faces in the front row or wherever they were in the theater, realize that this is all about them and that we've included details about their lives and that they have an original song on their anniversary or, or whoever we picked that night. That's kind of one of the most magical theater moments I've had in a really long time. Yeah, that definitely sounds really incredible. You mentioned COVID um, in the, the story that you just told. How, how has COVID like affected your career as an artist? What career? No, um, I, it's affected everything, right? I, I feel like we are, the theater is at the forefront of so many social issues, but this is one where we're just like right along everyone else, like we had to shut down for an entire year. So it, it's changed the industry. Everyone has been affected. I think there's a lot of people that are staying afloat, but as an actor, there's there's not a lot of resources to stay to stay in the craft. Um, I've been lucky and I've been able to transform myself and stay uh, uh, kind of within my world a little bit through teaching, through producing, through conversations. We're having lots of conversations around producing theater, even though we had to stop producing theater for a while. So that that has been it's been a, a, the, a silver lining for the past year for me. But I still have a ton of questions about what my career will look like after this. When we come back, what does coming back to theater look like? Will it change? Do we still have a few years where we're dealing with the repercussions of this? We just don't know. We have no idea, which is terrifying. Um, and also maybe exciting. Maybe we've got something beautiful just around the, um, the turn coming up. As a student, I feel somewhat shielded from the effects of COVID on you know, the world, on everybody. That that I, I I just want to point out, I feel like I've gotten to work more with younger students in the past year than I was for three years before that. I did do, um, I, I taught when I was younger. I, I was part of Berkeley Playhouse, a children's theater in the Bay. But for the past three years before 2020, I was just doing Shakespeare. I was just doing repertory theater. And, and coming back and, and being able to work with young artists again, kind of reinforced this idea that young artists are going to be the future and they're going to be the future in, in the very near future. 
all of these theaters are looking to reinvent themselves. And then I go and teach a class and all of these kids are like, oh, I can make you a beautiful story and a TikTok. I can do all of the editing myself. I can record my own instrumentation. You know, there's just so much ingenuity with young theater makers these days. And I think that's gonna influence how we come back. Yeah, it's true. The, the younger generation really does have a lot of ingenuity and creativity in them. And skills, right? Like yeah. our, my generation like knew MySpace and that was huge. We were so technological. Now, you know, my, my 13 year old brother can teach me how to use Excel better than I can. Uh, all, of, all of these skills you guys have at your disposal is amazing. Uh, what are three things you absolutely love about your job or jobs? I love people. I am totally a social butterfly. And I kind of said earlier to me, theater is about how we pay attention to one another in a really earnest way, in a really um, sensitive, particular sometimes way. And that feels really rewarding. I feel like I was drawn to this craft because we're all talking about our feelings and, and the human condition and the, the breadth of human emotion. And, and that really serves, serves me in a lot of ways. I think another thing I love is just make believe, like being stupid and being able to laugh at yourself and getting to wear costumes for a living and, you know, suspending disbelief, even when I'm a producer, even when I'm a director, even when I'm not on stage, there's just like a magic to theater that you engage in just by being in the space. And that's beautiful to see. Um, and what else? What's going to be my third one? Theater people are so smart. Like I, we, I, growing up, I only learned how to measure intelligence through book smarts. You know, you have this degree and you have this and this, and in the theater, we really get to talk about it all in a really engaging way. I know more about genetic sequencing from watching a play than I can honestly remember from my bio classes, um, or politics. We're constantly dissecting and analyzing the current moment that we're in through theater. And I find that's really beautiful. Although I feel like the politics aspect could be a little touchy. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think that when theater becomes political in that way, it's, it's actually can be a dividing force. And at the same time, I think good theater is the one that can have a political show or about this sensitive subject or, or this, this subject that divides us and still have everyone's buy-in and it, it's, it's a, 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 an experiment in humanity that we all stay in that room and don't rip each other's heads off. That's something about the play, we're, we're conversing through seeing this play together. If I'm hearing this correctly, what you're trying to say is good political theater makes it so that all the audience members, regardless of their opinions, don't want to rip each other's heads off. I think so, I think so. Maybe, I, I hope I don't regret this you know, thesis eventually, but I, I do think theater says something but it doesn't necessarily beat you over the head. You can have two different opinions, but as long as you leave questioning and respecting the humanity in the, the, the blue person on the other side of the theater or the woman on the other side of the theater or the queer on the other side of the queer, somehow you see the humanity across some divide. I think that's a win for me. Do you have a vision or hope for the future of your art form? Do you? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I think that you become an ever optimist if you really are a theater maker for most of your life. Um, so I have a lot of hope and knowing the, the people that are drawn to theater, I, I put all of my hope for humanity in theater folk, like they, they can change the world. But what that looks like, the vision, I'm not as sure. I'm really interested in working with young people right now because I think they have a lot to say, a, a lot of sage wisdom that we should be listening to. Um, we're also going through a huge revolution and underrepresented peoples that might have been on our stages in a lot of situations, but weren't in our power structures. We're reimagining that and we're, we're questioning uh, um, our practices. So I think I, I have hope because I see so much change on the horizon. Yeah, totally. Are there any shows or projects you're particularly proud of that you'd like to share with us today? I think over the past year, I've been working with a group of actors that we all kind of had the same draw job and we're all furloughed around the same time. So we started our own theater troupe and started producing each other's projects. And if someone was an amateur playwright, we tried to put that on its feet. 
or if someone had an adaptation of a Shakespeare play and they wanted a, a gender queer Juliet, we put that piece up with them. So I'm really proud of that project. One of my favorite pieces was doing Brandon Jacob Jenkins, um, an octoroon at Mixed Blood in Minneapolis. It's just such, and now now it's kind of been produced everywhere and people know it a lot, but at the time when it was, when it was a newer piece and it was so out there, it was so offensive to so many people, I really learned a lot about doing that type of theater, that type of provocative theater, that type of theater that made people really emotional in, in a, a variety of ways. But it was so fulfilling that everyone wanted to stay at the end of a show and talk about it. I just, I really dug that. So going back to what you said a little bit earlier, COVID definitely has had negative impacts on on actors and artists and all different kinds of people, but in some ways they've seemed to be brought together by it based off of the stories you're telling. Um, yes. So one thing I'm, I'm just super aware of is if you are a person who has had a lot of hardship in your life, oftentimes you will want to say, this is good and I've grown from it and I need to frame it in that in that way. And also I want to be sensitive to the idea that we I don't glorify hardship. If you've been here for long enough, you just grow a tough skin. Actors and theater makers in general are really, really resilient. And I think they will always find the silver lining in a hard situation. This is a, a once in a generation trauma that's happening to our in industry and to our communities, right? Like we've seen a tremendous amount of death that has affected so many actors I know. We've seen uh, uh, when the industry is threatened, your livelihood is threatened. I know a lot of people who have to leave this industry at the end of 2020 um, because they have to deal with medical bills and all of this and blah, 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 blah. So yes, I think there's some, this is an important step in our evolution. And I just don't wanna belittle how, how awful things have been for so many people. Um, some people seem to struggle to put emotion or character into, spoke, into their spoken words. Like me, I sometimes, feel like I struggle with this. So how would you go about doing this? And does it come naturally for you to put more emotion into your words? Mm, I, I am a very emotional person. I wear my heart on my sleeve, but I actually don't think I was very emotional when I was younger. I was, I had a lot, I repressed a lot of my emotions when I was a younger person. And this is kind of one of the reasons I was saying I'm drawn to theater. I, I always, there's this phenomenon when I send students to college for the first time, they always write me and tell me how amazing their first year in college acting class is, that I'm learning so much about myself, that I am changing as a person. And I think a lot of your training will focus around actually unlearning the habits of your character. All life is a performance, right? And, and we're carrying these habits around on, a, on us. I think a lot of acting training is just about freeing your voice, freeing your body, freeing yourself so you're open to these new characters. Um, and it's not necessarily about just the skill building it takes to, to kind of bring someone to life. Do you have anything to say to students who want to pursue a similar path to the one you took or the one you're taking? Ooh, I don't think you can. Uh, um, I think that my path to where I'm at as an artist right now was so varied and I had so many privileges and so many opportunities growing up that I, I don't think that my path is directly, you could not recreate the way I got here. Um, I was economically challenged growing up, I was poor. And so I got a lot of scholarships. I also, as a young black artist, I had no male black role models in acting. Well, all of a sudden I came at just the right time to get that teacher that was coming in for Othello and just the right time to get this teacher. So there's so many privileges in my life that, that brought me here. Um, but I will say, kind of going back to the idea of selfishness, I think if you want it bad enough, it will come. Um, and the reason I feel confident about that is because everything's changing. Even the way we train actors right now is changing. And who's to say it won't be completely different in three years? You know, your, your experience as a, a young person making the art that you're making online might be enough to project you into your, the, the next echelon of your career. I don't know what it looks like anymore. So it sounds like to me that drive and resolve and perseverance, determination, all these are critical parts of it. Super critical. And I think to get to that point, you have to know why are you doing this? 
Why, why is theater your passion? Um, I know you won't get to the next level. You won't push yourself hard enough if you don't have a really strong personal thesis for why you do the work, but you kind of just have to do it. You know, you're not a playwright until you put words on paper and you're not an actor until you just start doing it. So just do it. So Victor, I don't really know a ton about your performance history. Would you just kind of tell me what type of work you're interested in or involved in? Sure. So I'm definitely not as, I guess, versed in theater as a lot of my peers. I got into it at a, kind of a late stage in my life, maybe one or two years ago, really. So it wasn't necessarily there with me from the beginning, like a lot of my friends. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just more going into high school. And I like tried it a few times in the past, but I didn't necessarily enjoy it until again, one or two years ago when I, and I'm not entirely sure why it decided to kind of call to me at that moment. So uh, right now in the past year, I mean, you're in high school. So are, are they still doing productions? How do you engage with theater right now? They're definitely still doing productions uh, over, over Zoom and everything. I'm very impressed by my school's like theater um, department and their, how they're handling things during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also taking a theater class at my high school where this is also over Zoom. And we're making the best of the situation, I think. We, de we, uh, we obviously can't be there in person, but we make Zoom work. Yeah, I, I taught a class that was kind of like, you know, stage actors make films, make short films. And a lot of the students produced work on TikTok. And I was actually really surprised because it's social media. And so I don't, don't frame it as an artistic venture, but they really were telling stories, you know, creating characters using this medium. Um, so I want to ask you, what do you see in the future of theater making? Like what tools or what directions or I, I don't know, what are your thoughts? I definitely agree that social media can be used as a sort of art form. Like I'm personally not a big social media user myself, but I still firmly believe it's critical in the future of art. Hmm. Um, I, I have often like really, really longed to go in person to a theater in the past year. Do you already have plans to like be in production once we come back from this? I don't know, actually. Like, if there are plans, I was not informed. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you make it happen, I will be in the front row. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time today, William. It was amazing to learn about your career. Bye. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for tuning in to Opening the Curtain, Artists in Conversation with Students, a collaboration between TheaterWorks Silicon Valley and Palo Alto Unified School District as part of the Kennedy Center Partners in Education program. We will continue to explore different careers available in the performing arts throughout the school year. Please join us for the next set of videos in the series at the end of each month at theaterworks.org.